Okay, I'm I'm back here with another media law chat. Uh, this time with my good friend Boss. Boss, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what case we're going to be talking about today? Yeah, man. So I'm Boss Bastian. Um, I'm at Loyola University Chicago, where I'm currently still the program director for the Center for Digital Ethics and Law. So I'm always interested in cases that deal with digital technology, new technology. So that's why this case. Um, uh, call my interest because it is a case dealing with with uh, violent video games. All right, so it's Brown versus EMA, or Electronic yeah. Merchants Association. So give us a teeny little bit of background on the case. So this law was signed uh, in 2005 in California. So 2005 is of course a time when you saw more and more violent video games come um, come into existence. It's also a time where school shootings were caught in the attention of the public in 1999, we had uh, the Columbine shooting, which of course still resonated um, for years to come. So this, these two elements that caused a, a lawmaker from California called Leland Yee, who was a child psychologist who felt very strongly about the negative effect that these violent video games had, um, to sign this act into law. California was not the only state who had passed a bill like this. It's also in um, Illinois, a law like this was passed in Minnesota, in Michigan, and in most cases these laws were not upheld by, by the courts. Um, and this, the same thing happened in, in California at the, uh, the United States District Court for the Northern District of California, struck it down. The law actually never took effect, it was enjoined, so as soon as the law was signed, the, the video game industry tried to stop it from taking effect, and they were mm -hmm. successful in that. So, and at, both at the, the district level and the Court of Appeals, the law was struck down on uh, First Amendment grounds. A couple of other things maybe to, uh, to keep in mind is that the video games industry actually did have a self-rating system. Right. It was pretty effective. Um, back then, of course, you compared video games to DVDs <laughs> and, and CDs. That was kind of the frame of reference and compared to those. Those self-rating systems, the video game industry, video game industry came out on top. Actually, um, what else is there to say about this? Uh, we called Brown versus EMA, but initially it was Schwarzenegger. <laughs> EMA, because Schwarzenegger was was the governor at the time, so it's there's some irony in there that Schwarzenegger yeah. was was uh, defending a law that tried to limit violent content to minors. I think um, that I always forget that that it started out, uh, but you know, given uh, Schwarzenegger's movie history, it is kind of, it is ironic indeed, isn't it? And another irony is actually I just looked it up yesterday, but that uh, the lawmaker Leland Yee is currently finishing a five-year federal uh, sentence. He's in prison for um, gun trafficking. <laughs> really? Yes, I, I didn't know that. Uh, Embroiled with, with organized crime, so it's. Um, He's supposed to, he's, now he's in a halfway house, I've read. So he's supposed to be released in uh, in June. But so he was... I had no idea. Yeah, some kind of racketeering, um, gun trafficking, and other crimes. So he's been, he's been a disgraced lawmaker. And I think it's important to point out that there's a double intention behind this, this law. It's both to kind of reduce the, the likelihood of shootings happening, reduce mm -hmm. violent behavior. It's also... Um, intended to protect children from harm, right? So it's, it's these two, these two double, and sometimes I think that leads to a little bit of of confusion. I think there's one kind of overarching weakness with this law is if you really think that these video games are that dangerous that they cause harm to children, that they lead to shootings, then is really is the appropriate measure really putting a label on it and um, requiring parental consent to, in order to to buy them. The, the appropriate action, if you really believe that, would be to ban them. Mm -hmm. And I think the Supreme Court, the, in the decision, they hint at that. They're like, well, if you really think that these games are so dangerous, that seems a pretty pretty weak weak, weak measure. Right. So I think that's kind of an overall weakness to the argument. Um, I also I also think um, we're. Um, let me actually ask. <laughs> the argument seems awfully muddled to me. So whenever we discuss um, video game violence, it seems like everyone defaults to, well, you can't show any sort of causal link 
between consumption of this content and violent behavior. So, you know, you can't tie school shootings directly to the playing of Grand Theft Auto. But, but it seems to me that California was making a different kind of an argument, that the harm wasn't just this causal link um, to violence itself, but harm that comes to the kids just from the consumption. Mm, yeah, exactly. So, and I think when we discuss this case, we've sometimes focused too much on that first causal link that you mentioned. As, as you know, if you causal links like that are just very, very hard to establish in, in psychology and social sciences, and they take a long time mm -hmm. to, <laughs> to establish. So that's maybe something we can talk about later, just how the Supreme Court relies on scientific evidence here. <laughs> <laughs> if, if it is true that violent video games have that effect, it will probably take take science 30 years to figure this out, right? Longitudinal studies will establish that. Right. And I think that's all that's somewhat of um, um, a disagreement we see in a majority opinion and actually the concurrence of um, Alito and, and Roberts, who basically say, well, we need to we need to give lawmakers some leeway here. If mm -hmm. they think this is this is what they think based on the evidence available today, they think this is harmful. We should not with this high standards uh, of evidence um, in existence such as that has to be established scientifically, which is almost impossible to do. Uh, but I agree that the argument, the argument is, is modeled because it is, it, they're hinted, hinted at these two things together. And it's actually like the third thing, third thing they hint at, it's um, what comes back into the, to the center of, of Thomas saying, we need to give parents some help here. Mm -hmm. We need to give parents a helping hand. There's a deluge of, of content, and I think today it's even more true, right? There's so much, so much coming into the into the living room, in the houses, and parents need a little bit of help here from the state to decide what comes into their rooms and what they can keep out. Keep out. And we cannot depend on self-regulation. We cannot depend on the parents to to keep it in check. We need to give the parents a helping hand. Mm -hmm. And that's a third, a third argument that um, that's being being put forward. And again, that adds to how muddled the argument is, because that is actually the argument that um, Justice Thomas um, latched on for why this this law should be should be upheld. Right. And, and the idea, though, that um, that kids whose parents have deemed this content OK should have access uh, is always has always been a fascinating element of this case to me that um, saying, look, the, the parents are ultimately in charge and the state can't supplant them. So if a parent makes a decision that a nine year old can have Grand Theft Auto, then that that nine year old can have it. Uh, it's been an interesting element of the case. A lot of a lot of investment in in parents when some of the science does show that parents really underestimate these effects. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and because um, if if you do think that it's if it's harmful, you wouldn't say, well, if a, if your parents think it's okay to have a, to have a kid smoke cigarettes, mm -hmm. <laughs> we kind of that's that's fine. You wouldn't you wouldn't you would say no, kids can't smoke. Right. Uh, it's it's. Um, Right, I can't. I can't allow my my ten year old to go in and buy a pack of cigarettes. That's that's not. I don't get that choice. So it's it's an interesting um, how we think about harm arising from media content versus harm arising from other things. But again, cigarette regulation has changed over time as well as the science has evolved over time. And I think that's something interesting about this case is that you know, this reliance on science mm -hmm. because in in one way the court, or at least the majority, puts the the burden of proof very high, right? By requesting this, can you establish this uh, through science? On the other hand, science change. Right. Science changes. So you could make an argument if video games change. We have now, um, we're going to have I, a VR video games that's going to be even more immersive, mm -hmm. right? And science about that might change. So it's, it's kind of in, a one, in one way, um, loosens the foundation of this case somewhat because if you if you really hang your head on the science the moment science change looks like this case would be right to to revisit yeah do you think you know we're 15 years later now and and i think vr is a really interesting element to add into this um you know when how do the media effects change when something becomes so much more immersive uh do you think we're at a place where where brown versus ema could be revisited or should be revisited today? 
Yeah, I've been I've been thinking about that because um, there's a I say a lot of things changed. I think one thing that changed that you know this law was written in a time when people bought their video games in the store. Okay, sorry. Are you? Are yep. You hear me? Yep. I can okay. I can hear you. You just cut. You just slow down just a little bit. Okay. So well, because they mentioned that it has to be on the packaging, right? The label has to be on the packaging. Right. <laughs> this is still. No, I looked it up, and in 2005, about 80 percent of the games were sold in the in the store, and now it's the other way around. So mm -hmm. Almost 90 percent of the games are bought digitally. So that's that's something that I don't know how that would change, because you could argue, you know, if you have to buy it digitally, you have to have a credit card, you have to be 18. So the mm -hmm. problem is not as somewhat moved. On the other hand, gift cards, Amazon gift cards, would allow you to, to buy those games. So that's let's let's forego that that issue because there's other could be other restrictions right put on these games yeah do you think uh, sorry do you think that today in terms of labeling and disclosures the the video game industry is at the same place it was um you know in the early 2000s they you you're you're dead on right they were ahead of lots of other content producers in actually having a rating system does that is that still stand today i to the best of my knowledge i i do think so i okay. think there's still a self-rating system i'm to be honest, I'm not totally sure on, on that. On I'm that. not a big gamer, I have to confess. Yeah. <laughs> I buy Nintendo Switch games for my for my eight year old, so I'm not quite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But coming coming back to your to your question, so the, as I said, the science could change. Now imagine that we have another we have um, VR video games, and there's a school shooting, and we can establish that the shooter really almost trained himself through a VR, very immersive video game, and actually it made it harder for authorities to take him down because he that person was so good i'm saying he here uh, you know it's mm -hmm. a cool shoe, so you can make i guess the, the gender bias by a statement um so you could see how that that issue would come to the fore again and it has it has come to the fore because in reaction to the school shootings uh president trump and some republicans just to take blame away from guns, mm -hmm. they are pointing fingers again at video games. Right. So it's still very prevalent today. And um, and I think another aspect, um, not just in the school shootings, but in some of these um, hate motivated um, crimes, you actually see the shooters broadcasting or, or streaming it live as if they're in a game. So I think that's also renewed attention yeah. uh, to gaming. So and I, I do think that so it's not it's not impossible that this issue would be revisited. And then if you do look at how the, the, um, um, the decision came down, so we have a strange, like with, with many speech cases, you cannot really go with traditional yeah. uh, Republic, uh, conservative versus liberal justices. Because if you look at, at the majority, um, we have Scalia basically joining up with um, Ginsburg, um, Sotomayor and Kagan and Kennedy. Uh, so we have the Kennedy, um, Scalia, Sotomayor, Kagan, and who do I see here? Um, Kennedy, Sotomayor, Kagan, Ginsburg, and Ginsburg. Yeah. So that's of these this five person majority, two have left the bench. Mm -hmm. uh, Kennedy left the bench, and uh, Justice Scalia passed away. So it shrinks to three. Then we have the two concurrence, uh, concurs, um, which are um, Steven, is it Stevens? Stevens, yeah. Stevens and Alito yeah. concurred, but they really disagreed with most of the judgment, right? Mm -hmm. So they said this is this is vague, right? This is this this should be struck down void for vagueness. But otherwise, I think we should we should allow if this we should allow um, lawmakers to make this calculation. We should yeah. respect them. So they actually, you could argue, if a, a law would be written that's not vague, they would be on board with that. So, mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have Breyer and Thomas, who are also in favor of, of these laws. So you have a good, a good switch, right? So it, it would, the question comes, where would Kavanaugh fall on, these, uh, on this issue? On and, and Gorsuch, too. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and Gorsuch is, it's, I, I, I don't think I'm an expert enough to say how, how they would rule, but it's interesting to know that only, you know, the traditional conservative justices, or there's only one Scalia who was in favor of striking this down. Yeah. So now you have two new conservative justices coming in and 
you know, three of the four conservative justices at the time kind of were in favor of these types of laws. Mm -hmm. So it's really not, I don't think it's that far-fetched to, to think that if facts change, that one of, I think Gorsuch actually is said that to be, to be more in mold of, of Scalia, kind mm -hmm. of more of uh, free speech. So I think Gorsuch might imitate Scalia here, but uh, Kavanaugh, I, I have no idea. It's, I think it's very... Very well possible that that it would that it would switch. Um, yeah, there's not a lot in Kavanaugh's record on expression, yeah. is there? No, sort of the it's, unknown it's, unknown yeah. quantity right now. Yeah, it's hard to read things on that one. But if I, I kind of have the impression of more like a family values arguments mm -hmm. would sit well with him, you mm -hmm. know, and I, I could see him um, uh, be in favor of a law like this, especially. That this is this is the conservative movement seems to like that because yeah. it takes uh, attention away from from um, Second Amendment issues. Yeah, and and certainly deference deference to the legislature and deference to the executive branch, uh, yeah. you know, would say, well, if you as long as you've crafted something that's not vague and it's not overly broad, we're yeah. going to show that deference. So it would be it would be a really interesting, uh, really interesting, to, like outcome, a really interesting set of changes just in how the overall makeup of the court hasn't swung dramatically, um, but just the individual expression focus of those of the justices that have changed. I think it'd be an interesting argument. I mean, like Scalia and Thomas vote, 91% of the cases, they're, they vote similarly, right. not the same. And this is their total opposite opposite ends, they're yep. both originalist and just as Thomas making or just makes an just argument he, he is saying that the first amendment never was intended to um to protect speech directed at minors mm -hmm. he thinks that if you if you speak to minors you have to go through the parents and if you don't do that you are not protected by the first amendment yeah. and he 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 roots this in, in a kind of originalist argument so um Scalia is also an originalist and it came out on the, on the other, hand. other side. So yeah. I, I might say more about originalism than, than its respective justice. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, this is fascinating. Um, I am so glad that we did this. It's a great case. Okay. It's coming It's coming in perfect timing because uh, we are dealing with uh, violent content in my class this afternoon, as a matter of fact. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, continuing to talk, we're in that we're in that phase right now of uh, the the things the Supreme Court has refused to define out of First Amendment protection. So, uh, yeah. if I just that's that's interesting because there, this is a number of cases like United States versus Stevens, United States versus Alvarez. This case where United States the the court basically said um, we should. Shop is closed on adding new categories to obscenity, incitement. You cannot do that. You're going to have to go through a strict scrutiny, and mm -hmm. all that, which makes, makes it much harder. So, and, and when we talk about today about harmful speech, or maybe transphobic speech, and, and, and speech like that, where we say, this is harmful, right? Mm -hmm. well, and it shows how hard it is to make an argument, right? Because it's both from the perspective that we don't have a categories of speech outside of the First Amendment, we don't allow new categories of speech, and we just make the, the standard for defining harm so um, so demanding. Right. right. So you, it's just gonna, you cannot say, well, we, we can establish maybe scientifically that this is harmful to uh, transgender youth to, to be exposed to this type of this type of speech, but based on this standard, you'll never, you'll never be able to, to bargain. Right. So I think that's that's why this case is, is important. It kind of goes beyond beyond these issues, and it just makes it makes clear how the Supreme Court thinks about you know harm and, and how hard it is to to bar that. Yeah, no doubt. It's a difficult line of cases. Hate speech, hate speech, and violence is really some of the toughest uh, toughest stuff we tackle in class, I think, and and something that a lot of people just misunderstand. Uh, they can't can't quite understand why it should be this hard to regulate expression that that causes demonstrable harm. Um, but the, the bar is indeed high. Strict, strict scrutiny is strict indeed. <laughs> oh, except, except when nudity is involved. By the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I we got the whole bugaboo about sex. Then, then we got an issue. Yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you so much, boss. I really appreciate you talking with us today.